Oh, look at this. This is why we waited. Just for you. <laughs> so I'd like to welcome everyone to what is this week five of the spring semester. I had to think which semester it was. And so, Alex, this is our departmental NHS. OHHC2I, which is our Center of Excellence for Oceans, Human Health, and Climate Change Interactions, and our graduate student organization sponsored seminar series. And we do this every Wednesday at noon during the spring and fall semester. And I believe that you have traveled furthest to engage with us. So we have a number of seminar speakers who are from you know, the other side of town, and they complain about coming <laughs> over here, and they have someone that's traveled halfway around the world. So we are darn, darn excited. For those of you that may not know, Alex, Dr. Deco and myself had the, the privilege of co-chairing one of his PhDs. And can you name everyone else on the committee? So yourself, myself, Dr. Oswald, Mike Fulton, and Dr. Cohen. Dr. Cowan. So I cheated a little bit. I pulled his dissertation off my shelf. <laughs> I'm still in therapy about yeah. that. So. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. And we actually have a number of, of stories we can tell about Alex, including I told him he made me out to be a fibber because I was telling people that I would guarantee that Alex would show up with a bow tie because he was known as quite the dapper dresser when he was here. And at the time, the president of the university was Dr. Sorensen, Dr. Sorensen okay. who was also known for <laughs> Botox. And I can recall Alex dressing very similarly to the president. And so we had the bow tie tour <laughs> with President Sorensen. So Alex made quite the impression upon us here. And as evidenced by this shopping list of degrees, <laughs> titles, affiliations, it is clearly obvious that Alex represents our School of Public Health and our department and public health in general very well as he went back home to Romania. And as Alex pointed out, this is the first time we've had a chance to visit in over a dozen years. 13. 13? A little bit more. Than years. 13 since my last coming here, 17 since my uh, moving back to Romania. So. And with that, Alex, I'm going to turn the floor over to you, sir. Thank you so much, Dr. Porter. Thank you so much to all of you for being here. Uh, I'm uh, really glad to see that, you know, things didn't change. I was afraid that after 17 years, I won't be able to get around. But obviously, something changed, many things changed, but not to the point where I couldn't recognize it. Now, I'm really glad to be here back and honored to give this talk. This is really honoring me, and this is also helping me with the paperwork for coming here. Since uh, as head of the department, I won't be able usually to miss too much from my university on a regular basis. Uh, my name is Alex Petrishore, and um, as uh, Dr. Porter mentioned, I'm from Romania, where I earned my uh, doctoral, my, my second doctoral degree, but obviously all the degrees before, the, the bachelor degree and some other small degrees, more or less important, not small. But, and uh, after coming here, I earned a master degree in biostatistics followed by a PhD in environmental health sciences. I returned to Romania and uh, in the process of having my paperwork recognized, I said that uh, probably a second PhD from there would show everyone that I can't get the PhD, it's not getting just some work recognized. So for that purpose, I had to work a lot and change the fields. I changed the fields not so much because there wouldn't be positions in a given field, but because when you travel around the world, what you mean by something like biostatistics may vary from one country to another. So uh, obviously, even the classification of fields of those of you who are publishing and uh, work, look for them on the web of sciences 
they may notice that there is a difference, for instance, between the web of sciences and scopus in terms of classifying mediums. And so when you come up with natural, national classification systems, things get even more complicated. Now, currently, I am, an, I am a professor and a head of department in our doctoral school of urban planning at Yonminko University of Architecture and Urban Planning in Bucharest. Uh, starting last year, I have an equals full position with the university, Technical University of Moldova in the neighboring country in Moldova, as you know. And I also work part-time with two national research institutes, which are actually part of the research system, not, of, not under some university, mainly working in some projects over there. And uh, when uh, Dr. Porter gave me the chance to give a talk here after so many years, I had been thinking, what should I be saying? And one of the proposals was uh, something that would somehow uh, connect all the pieces of the puzzle, which is my life, uh, my academic life from getting the first degree, let's say, the bachelor's degree, until nowadays. And uh, uh, one of the things I've done in Romania was a habilitation thesis. A habilitation is a higher doctoral degree. You have to write a thesis like for a PhD, defend it. And based on that, you obtain the right to advise doctoral research. And when I had to do that, uh, I had to go across my career so far. So that helped me somehow for the presentation, but at that moment it looked like it's the end of, uh, but all end is usually the beginning of a new life. So better things happen after that one, which I had to put here on this presentation. And uh, so uh, to make the speech a little bit shorter, I will start passing to the first part of the presentation by the doctoral work I've done here. Uh, the doctoral work I've done here basically was consisted of uh, developing some methodologies, which would first of all, use microbial imagery to turn it into maps, analyze it using the spatial tools used by geographers to analyze their maps and analyze them in a quantitative way, meaning turning the maps into numbers. And then using the statistical skills, turning the numbers into something that's meaningful from a scientific perspective. And uh, the title of my thesis is here. I'm showing here numbers throughout the presentation, which are not, uh, other, which are the other ones uh, in the image other than the slide number. And um, in the end, there will be a list of references, but basically I think there are three representative articles I had produced for the, for the PhD during the PhD. There were others published later on. And uh, this first one, for instance, deals with the uh, process of uh, boring canals through the oids and uh, for the calcium carbonate oids. And there are two stages and the, and the difference between them consists of a higher density of canals. And by using the approach I had developed throughout my doctoral thesis, I was able to show that there are differences and to have tools for, for quantitatively analyzing the differences in the calcium in the process of boring canals for these oils. Similarly, there are other stages and the difference which the second article dealt with uh, consists of the precipitation of calcium, which again is more intense in some of them than in the others. So again, using the same approach and looking this time at the calcium uh, precipitates, I was able to show differences in this process and that would be an indication of the stages. And a third one was a totally different one was the reconstruction of biovolumes with the potential application of being able ultimately to measure the volume of a biofilm or of bacterial structures. And uh, this were the ones produced at that moment. As you can see in the right, uh, site that's actually from the dissertation itself. Uh, I'm taking the idea that, uh, you know, after all, the microscopy is a process, it's a reverted process to aerial photography or to any traditional remote sensing. But in some sense, you obtain an image which can be turned in and analyzed like a map. So we have a different type of material, GIS, I call it. I think it was a little bit too much for the moment, but anyway, it looked good when in terms for the publishers. 
so um, with that in my mind, I finished my doctoral degree and uh, some many years later, thanks to Dr. Beko, we published another article looking this time uh, at the uh, activity of soil fate reducing microorganisms. And uh, again, looking at different phases and finding differences. And the paper was published in 2014, many years after my PhD, but that was the only part of my PhD which hadn't been published at some point. Apart from it, everything went to some paper during the PhD program or later on. Uh, so uh, this somehow concludes my work on um, environmental microbiology. When I went back home, uh, I had to change things a lot. And as I said, one of the things I had to do was to do a second doctoral degree. At this time, I had done some doctoral work over two years. That's the duration of my PhD program then, in geography, where since I already had the methodology, I used it this time to geography, but to human geography. And of course, there are many studies that uh, uh, were representative for the programs. Uh, one of them, for instance, was dealing here with land cover and use changes and, uh, and some tools that were somehow pinpointing the hotspots where these processes were very intense in Romania for different kind of processes affecting land cover and use. And uh, at that moment, this was not published in a very good journal or very well, but uh, this was actually the start point of what now, I, what now consists the main point of my career, dealing with land cover and use changes, this time at the usual scale, obviously based on uh, remote sensing, based on satellite imagery, and uh, mostly based on uh, European freely available data like here in the United States through a different program and with a different classification scheme. Um, but uh, as I said, at the point of the PhD, I had just to develop methodologies. So when I applied them, I applied them to things that may look very different. So this image here below, for instance, is from an article uh, in dealing with um, land covering use, but focusing on the urbanization processes in Romania. The one above uses the same approach to pinpoint areas potentially affected by climate changes in Romania. So it's a different, at the same tool, different uh, topic of research. And um, during my study, my doctoral studies here at USC, I found a particular inter particularly interesting approach published later to look at the orientation of different segments of cyanobacteria, which look like some spaghetti. And uh, I was, we were wondering, we were speculating that this has to do with their orientation towards the light. And so that was proven with, an, uh, with a program that didn't exist at that time, actually not a program, but an application in GIS that would look for made by, an, uh, by a segment with the north, let's say. So at that moment, this application was developed by someone in California and was, I was able to use it for my PhD program here. And later on, I applied, I used the same tool in Romania to show that in Romania, the transportation doesn't allow people to reach from one side of the country to the other one, be it from east, west, or from north to south, because actually the landforms interrupt somehow and make you need to have a detour of your path. And so this image here, I'm not sure whether it is, it is seen very well, looks at the dominant orientation of railroads, of roads, and so on in different counties in Romania. Another application, another application of geostatistical tools. And then um, when I was working on my PhD, a colleague came to me and uh, asked me about uh, a way to see whether um, in case of an extreme security event at the national level, you would be, or perhaps, you know, here, the hurricanes or something like this, you would be able to evacuate people over large distances. And he was looking at the potential evacuation routes in an European context. And I developed the methodology, and uh, this was also published. This is part of the methodology you can see here. Um, so this used to be, again, my second doctoral 
this is, as you can see, applications as diverse as they can be, but still kept together by a common methodology. Uh, and uh, here came the moment when I had to go for a habilitation, which was this time in planning. And then this moment when I had to develop the application in planning, uh, I said that, uh, first of all, here things have to put some order in the research I had done so, so far. And at that moment, I came up with some with an article that, first of all, showed the importance of uh, inter-trans multidisciplinary uh, research. By the way, these concepts are somehow challenged by different people, and obviously there is a gradient of them, but uh, you probably won't see two researchers who, who really agree on the gradient which is which and what do they mean? But that means basically the cooperation between different disciplines uh, to, different degree, to different extents up to forming altogether a new discipline eventually. And uh, here I had shown the importance of doing that for planning, uh, but uh, also there was a study that of importance, uh, of a great importance for me, uh, which is number 11 here, number 11 here, again deals with land cover and use and uh, related to the urban growth of our country. Uh, but also in this thesis, I had to come up with the methodological side. And uh, when I worked on my second PhD, uh, there was a lady who found out a method I had developed. And this method is called the, uh, it's basically taking principal component analysis and combining it, merging it with GIS. And based on that, you can visualize the results and you can have developed maps that would show the gradients in different things. So for instance, this lady developed it, she was a colleague of mine going for a PhD, but she used my tool for her thesis and she was able actually to, by doing that uh, to show the development trends for a certain region of Romania and see which were how the development can be specialized ultimately. And uh, also another method that had been of interest and had been counted here was uh, similar, but applied to the national territory to look at the development across different zones and uh, basically substantiate the public policies related to uh, territorial planning, to the plan territorial planning of the entire country. And this is number 13 here. Um, sometimes, you know, climb, uh, there were some works that were purely theoretical. So if I had to show my research here, I would group it in several big themes, with one of them would be the pure theoretical ones. Uh, this paper, for instance, dealt with um, the connection between uh, the, what is called basically global changes nowadays. And here we talk about land cover and use changes, about the alteration of uh, uh, energy flows and uh, also climate changes. Uh, but here I showed, uh, I put it somehow in a perspective where uh, obviously there were two circles, the vicious circle and the virtuous circle where planning could influence some of the things. Uh, then um, I started working also in urban ecology and uh, the image above, on the right above is a model of the urban ecosystem. During the time I proposed several models and uh, the one above was, this, was the first one. This was a model based solely on the environmental perspective. But some years later after learning the two degrees, one in ecology and one in geography, PhDs, I developed another multidisciplinary view. And uh, the next image, which has a little bit more colors on the bottom, presents the urban ecosystem from the joint perspective of uh, geography and of ecology. So these are purely theoretical papers uh, uh, published uh, and somehow representative for what I had done. But my, the applied research is the one that defines me mostly. And uh, initially, since, as I said, I started working with uh, on land cover and use and their changes only from the second PhD and not as the main topic. Um, initially, I didn't dare publishing in top journals or submitting to the, to the top journals. 
And I have a paper which is quite cited, published in some international proceedings, the one here showing actually the process and the, the relationship. Uh, of course, here, as far as I could see from the literature over many years, I shouldn't be saying that because now people are already convinced that, you know, the, what the urban nature is basically a green infrastructure which needs to be planned in order to deliver ecosystem services for all the citizens of the city. But uh, back in Romania, the planning, uh, the planners are architects. They do not have so many, so much environmental background that they have always to convince them in conferences about that and about the importance of the green infrastructure. Uh, this being again, the virtuous circle because there is a vicious circle as well. Uh, but uh, I was able to see for, to show for instance that um, since Europe has a, a more structured approach to the green infrastructure, there is a directive of the European Commission defining it, including its components. I was able to show that this actually um, coincides with the categories of urban nature as defined by coverage in 2015. And these categories of urban nature include uh, let's say the natural nature, that's not the very best description, but that's remnants of the nature that once existed there. Then extensions of the nature consisting of uh, urban agriculture or some other extensions. And then um, you have what is known by most people as the typical urban uh, nature, the landscape spaces, which are developed by landscape architects for leisure or just as green spaces. And finally, you have species that just happen to be there. You know, when I left, when I lived here in Colombia, I think one night I couldn't sleep. So when I opened my door, here there was here was a fox looking at me from the yard. <laughs> and probably both many of you had such encounters. And that's the kind of force type of nature. Uh, anyway, I was able to show uh, that data suggest the coincidence of this one's looking at the Romanian ones. And the, the article Dr. Scott mentioned that drew his attention is the one where I started working with uh, some uh, planners from Poland. And we started a series of comparative studies looking at the dynamics of the green infrastructure in, Urb in Romania and Poland in the cities and comparing them based on geospatial data. You can see an image below. Uh, in the first article, we looked, we, we tried to see the overall picture. And this overall picture showed that Europe lost its green infrastructure and keeps fragmenting it. But uh, of course, we are not pleased with that only. So uh, we decided, even, this, even though this research was not funded and we are all volunteering to do it, we decided to go further down and explore a little bit more into it. And we found out that, uh, for instance, the landscape spaces exist only in large cities. Uh, the smaller cities have their green infrastructure formed mostly by natural areas that remain there and agricultural areas that once existed around. And this is a pattern at least typical for Eastern Europe somehow. And when it comes to the loss, obviously the more you have, the more you lose. So the loss is propor proportional somehow to the categories of green infrastructure. And uh, this was not all. The second article, I'm not showing it here because it was a little bit, uh, it has less images and I decided to do like I do in our university presentation based on images where I just say what they represent. Um, the other one, the second paper, showed also some planning practices in the involvement of different urban actors in the process and their ability to really help preserving the green infrastructure and developing it. And it turned out that, again, we talk about Eastern Europe, some of you who are aware of Eastern Europe know that Eastern Europe went from a centralized system to an open market, to open market economies and political systems, but people didn't do that change yet. So people are still waiting very much from the authorities and civil society is not so organized and active and proactive in terms of dealing with the green infrastructure. So still the public authorities play an important role and they are somehow expected to do that. 
And uh, when we came with a series of recommendations for planners in order to present their work, their proposals more effectively, but also become more aware of the importance of the green infrastructure. So there were some, some papers already published, and of course our research goes on, keeps going on. But uh, when I talk about, um, about uh, the, the land cover and use changes, I had done quite extensive research. And uh, as you could see in the first stage of my career, I was the one to develop methodologies and develop tools. But of course, I started getting older, so I started get, finding younger people who were still able to do that. And I had the idea, but I didn't have any more the patience and the resources to develop the tools myself. And so other people started developing them. And in this case, we analyzed what the changes in land cover and use over the whole Romanian territory for 30 years. The 30 years that passed since uh, the dispatch of communism in Romania. And uh, of course, here we found out which were the dominant processes um, and also explained them because we published them in top journals. So we had to analyze very carefully what happened. And we found out that pre pretty much what happened was the property restitution. The communist regimes confiscated property. And when it was returned to people, but when it was returned to people, there were no restrictions as to changing the land cover in use. So uh, people were given back, let's say a forest, they would cut it off, sell the wood and build some housing developments or something like this. And that's why basically all these things happen. And we talk about intensive urbanization, we talk about uh, deforestation, we talk about abandonment of uh, agricultural land, which is eventually taken over by constructions and so on and so forth. And so this gave us a perspective of analyzing quantitatively and finding the hotspots and uh, somehow locating the areas where these processes were influencing very much. As I said, it's been published in uh, a remote sensing at that time, a journal in the first quarter. Uh, so after that, there were some uh, applied researches uh, dealing with some other topics, and uh, sometimes the figure is not. Uh, telling me too much. For instance, this is the one uh, where we're looking at hotspots of where different processes were important and affecting Romania. Here we're looking again at the processes and their importance, which would be most important in different periods. Uh, and uh, we're looking also, I was trying also to develop some tools and find the best data that would be that are to be used for processes occurring either at the urban scale or at the regional scale. Because uh, of course, luckily in the European Union, we have such data. Uh, it turns out that not everywhere, for instance, now I'm working on a research, since I work also in the Technical University of Moldova, I'm doing a comparison between the dynamics of the green infrastructure in Bucharest and Chisinau. And Chisinau is only partially covered by such data. Luckily, there used to be um, exercise of developing spatial data for Kishinov for a certain period just for comparison purposes, and I used what I have. But um, in other cases, we, I was looking at how such data works, and it turned out that um, obviously, uh, when you derive uh, the lower resolution data from the higher resolution data, you basically act like applying a majority filter and uh, the features that are small but maybe important are lost in the, in the end. And uh, as again, as I said in this article, we de I dealt with the hotspots affected, uh, with the hotspots affected by different land cover and use changes over the Romanian territory at different moments in different times. And uh, I've done some uh, work on the relationship between deforestation and uh, landslides or deforestations and uh, floods. And obviously here you do not have a direct, you may have a direct connection, but you are not able to prove. What you are able to prove is that once you have done the deforestation, that the land is no, able, no longer able to be resilient to the effects of floods and landslides. And uh, obviously wherever deforestation is occurred mostly, you may have a maximum of floods and landslides because obviously you no longer have a forest to keep to hold on the land. 
Uh, and we were able to see even relationship between different, pro different uh, uh, processes. This image above with many colors is from an article about um, um, about um, the processes occurring in Eastern Europe in general, in Romania in particular. And uh, we were also able to look at the distribution of these processes across the landforms and across other things, as you see in the image below. And um, recently, this was an article which I have published recently. And when I say recently, I mean 2023. It's been published this year already in a journal from the second quarter. Um, and uh, this work is about uh, the natural protected areas of Bucharest and Poland. We had chosen several representative case studies and we analyzed the ability to preserve them, to preserve them in the, mean, in the meaning of protecting them from the pressure of real estate investments. And uh, we showed by this article that unfortunately for Eastern Europe, only if you have a national protection status, you are able to safeguard them from being used by the investors. Uh, for instance, uh, forests are always protected in both countries, but in some sense, only generally. And now what used to be a black and white area, meaning that you either protect them or you don't protect it, has turned into a gray area where you have different types and some of them are protected more than the others, which actually makes room for the possible pressure of investors uh, resulting into losing some natural protected areas. And the, the image below is Bucharest's largest wetland area uh, uh, and uh, a representative example for this because um, obviously you say natural protected area, right? And the first word that comes here is natural, but actually what you see there is the result of an abandoned project and the, the colonization of nature over an abandoned project. So there is nothing natural, although the process of nature colonizing an abandoned space is very natural, but doesn't have anything to do with the idea of a natural protected area seen as a pristine area, which you safeguard especially exactly precisely because it is pristine and you want to preserve it for the years to come. But this was the only one not to have this large area, which is a wetland now again, taken by the private investors and coming up with houses on the lakeshore and such. And so declaring it a natural protected area against the fact that it is not natural was the only way of, of, of protecting her from this. And uh, the second case study, uh, the one on the right is from Poland, on the top on the right is Poland, but the top above, uh, this uh, area here is this color, which is sort of a grayish, is a forest close to Bucharest. But you know, if you look at it, it looks like a plan, right? And you can see that actually you already have the parcels, the land parcels. And so actually what happens is that the investors are planning to take over. And as long as we still have the national legislation protecting it from being used by the investors, it stays as a forest. If not, it will turn into an urban development like in the area surrounding because the pressure is, can be seen already. Right. And um, I had done some, in, some work which uh, I enjoyed. On, uh, on, on, but this is a very, very cited article, unfortunately not highly cited yet, but hopefully it will be one day. Uh, comparing, and um, I wished I had South Carolina included here, but I had to do it fast and it took me very many years to put the, together a team of people from, um, from Asia, Vietnam represented, from Africa, Algeria represented, and from Romania. And we analyzed the dynamics of coastal areas and of urbanization in the coastal areas. Uh, and uh, this, the image in, uh, uh, in the left, on the left side is with the Romanian, is with the free, actually with the free coastal areas. So this is the Romanian one, this is the, Vietnamese one, and this is the Algerian one. And of course, they showed different things. The article was very complex, and uh, actually, we had to eventually split it into articles at some point 
because of its of being actually composed of three large case studies. But we were able to show that uh, the wet, uh, the coastal areas are at great risk again due to the pressure of investments. And um, also, I had done some work uh, on. Um, on um, Algeria, where we're looking at the management of waste that's above the, the image in red. And uh, an interesting work which I've done in Algeria was uh, a typical urban ecology study. And you see the two images here. Basically, what I'm showing here is that uh, we um, classified the land use in three ways. And uh, what you have in different ways. Uh, red is urban, what you have with green is green space, and the yellow is intermediate space. It has some vegetation. It's not quite urban, but it's not still a typical um, green space. And uh, what you show, what you see as shades, is actually the diversity measured by some biodiversity indexes. indices. And uh, we show that basically this green, areas are the most important reservoirs for biodiversity, for urban biodiversity. And uh, of course, we were able to do that across, across uh, the city. It is a quite, challenge, quite challenging to get data for Algeria, but luckily I had an Algerian collaborator and we were able to publish uh, this research too. And um, you know, since I have a career spanning over 17 years, uh, it moves from doing things, as you see, initially I developed methodologies, uh, then I had other people developing methodologies, I learned how to have other people doing things. Have, uh, so uh, from that moment, I went up to supervising research and after receiving my habilitation, I had supervised some research, some of it actually dealing with um, topics that obviously represent the main part of my research as well. So this image is from another uh, article published in a second quarter journal last year, and it's about developing uh, ecological corridors. Uh, this is a very interesting research in terms of coordinating it because uh, as you say, see, I have joint appointments. So in the research institute, my colleagues got a research grant and they used it also for their thesis. So all the things came together and this research was actually joining, merging all the three things. Uh, then um, last year I advised a student from Iraq and they were planning actually to reconstruct their country and uh, they were aimed, they took a case study and they came up with a spatial plan, which actually puts in a planning perspective the 17 sustainability goals. And so it's actually an application, a typical example of uh, spatial sustainability because each proposal deals with a specific goal in some area. And um, this is another research I had supervised on the, on the bottom right. And this actually deals with uh, creating uh, a platform for uh, uh, for monitoring uh, the development in functional urban areas. This is a little bit away from the environmental part, but has to do a lot with the geostatistical part, which, which stays still as one of my advisement topics. So it is still represented, and I find students that are developing such methodologies as they have done at some with some time ago. So. This is in a step, snapshot of the research I have been doing over 17 years. And obviously uh, there is a continuity here, but also a shift from developing methodologies to have to, uh, to from developing methodologies for, spe for specific purposes to finding the best methodologies for the purpose for well-defined purposes. So jumping from the opportunity to creating opportunities, from uh, doing things to supervising things, from individual research to collaborative research and so on and so forth. 
And of course, doing that over 17 years, plus the ones here, I was able to learn some lessons, which I will gladly share. And uh, I will give you, I will, Give you another example, you know, actually two of them, although they say the same thing. Um, this is something I'm showing in the course of my research methodology to my students. And basically here, the same take home message is the one here, never give up. But what it says is that I had a study which I love, I just love. I learned during the student uh, years that um, the communist regime, after exterminating the humans, the enemies, some of you might have read 1984. Uh, they passed to exterminating nature and there were natural enemies found guilty for um, uh, the policies that were implemented in the agricultural sector, which didn't lead to the yield they promised initially. So they tried to exterminate entire species and I documented that this was an atypical research I had done with great passion, up to the extent of uh, using personal funds for it. So instead of getting funding from research, I funded the research myself. And uh, ultimately, I wanted to have the results publishing because they were quite interesting and they were showing the result of an extensive documentary research. And so I submitted it to a journal and they rejected it because they said it's too political and we don't publish anything that has to do with politics. And so from that moment, I said, well, maybe I'll go off. And then I found out that, uh, that was very interesting. I found out that, that this journal, when they rejected me, they said, well, perhaps you should go to an environmental history journal. So I looked up which journal would deal with environmental history. And I can see one here, and you can see one here. These are the, the two ones. Both rejected me at different stages, saying that it doesn't fit their scope. So what should I understand when an international journal sends, them to, sends you to them and they say, no, no, not for us. So anyway, at some point I found a journal in the Philippines. Uh, by the way, these are the impact factors and this is the time frame. So uh, this journal had a very poor communication and changed its management all over the time. And I had to wait, as you can see from some point before in the fifth, in, in 2015, up to after 2018, when I finally decided to withdraw my paper and resubmitted it. So it can come one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and nine, nine journal publishes it a little bit better off than I used to be here initially. And uh, also I had an art, one of the articles that you had seen already, had a similar history. I submitted it to a journal thinking that it would make a good contribution. They rejected it, so I kept it kept bounce, bouncing back from 2019 up to 2021 when it's been publishing. So one of the things is, of course, do not hesitate crossing the borders between the disciplines because this is productive, as I could see it from the first doctoral degree here, which allowed me to use the geographical methods in microbiology. Uh, and so uh, try also to look at things in your, in, from a perspective ranging from looking it from above, from the sky, as I put it, and then up to the, down to the grassroots level in order to understand the phenomenon. So change the scale also to understand it better. Also, it is good to, insight, to explore the insights of different cultures. And this came up ultimately when I had to do research together with people from Algeria, from Vietnam, from many countries. And uh, this is also useful. Also, do not ever take things for granted, for, for granted. Explore them and try to see if everything is true because things might not be true. Do not hesitate to ask questions. Do not try to get yourself the answer. Perhaps other people have the answer. Uh, I remember once when working on my PhD and uh, I had to write to molecular probes a letter and they explained me something and I didn't know why something was happening and they had the technical explanation of that. So you never know who can provide you a very nice explanation. Similarly, after some years I had done, uh, I had been asked uh, by a, a Romanian research institute on uh, infectious diseases to do to work on a study dealing with uh, the spread of uh, 
avian flu, I think. And at that moment, it turned out that the top of the mountain seemed to be better off than the field regions. And uh, uh, they came up even with explanations. But I looked things uh, up using a simple map with the administrative boundaries without any data on it. And at that point, it turned out that actually when you have administrative units going on the mountains, their territories are larger because they expand towards the ridges of mountains. So because of that, when you do the spatial interpolation, it appears that the data very is sparse. It isn't sparse, that's because of the size of the administrative units. So there was not a real thing going on, it was just an artifact in the data, but you have to figure out things like this uh, and uh, also ask questions to get it. Uh, also, if you do not find the appropriate tools, do not try to make your own tools. I'm always having this statistical background, trying to make things always simpler. So instead of writing some complicated te test, I wouldn't even understand, simplify the problem, aggregate data and run something simpler. Uh, Dr. Deco knows it very well because I ended by using on all our papers very simple statistical tools, ultimately, such as t-tests or something like this, not very complicated ones. And uh, of course, of, uh, it is good always, and you're doing it with the PhD, but life, you do not know where life is taking, try to find your niche, define it and hold there to your niche. And finally, as I said before, never give up. Now, from here, you have the references, uh, and I leave the presentation here as soon as have, if you want to read more of the new research I've been briefly presenting. Uh, please uh, go ahead. Most of uh, Romania usually encourages very much publishing in open access journals. Most journals are open access, so you will be able to find the research, but if not, you have my contacts. I'll give you the contact uh, if you don't have it. And, Please ask me, and I will be glad to share the paper. You can find my profile on uh, ResearchGate, and uh, my response rate is 100%. So I never <laughs> fail anyone who asks the paper. So thank you so much for everything. I hope that uh, 17 years were fit in 45. <laughs> Welcome, any question? And I do really welcome questions. Thank you very much, Alex. Wow, 17 years and 25 minutes. <laughs> impressive. And some <coughs> impressive to see in some respects you've stuck to your roots from what you did here, but you've expanded the spatial scale a bit. Questions for Alex? Dr. Deco. Uh, so, Alex, with climate change going on, a lot of People in certain parts of cities are, are suffering from high temperatures. Uh, and they're finding out that green areas, in many cases, decrease the average temperature of a city. And is this something you're, you're finding in Bucharest and other uh, Romanian yes, cities? Yes, you find it, and you find it even on the top of that. The concept that is implemented now globally is called nature-based solutions. So basically whatever means construction material, be it the concrete, be it the stone, be it the brick, be it used for housing, be it used for roads or for other ones, uh, does not help and has some other effect. And this effect is soil sealing. So in order to prevent that, even if you don't have vegetation, at least you have to uncover the natural soil because that has better properties and can decrease the temperature and can head handle also better the precipitations. Uh, now, of course, when I'm doing that, this kind of research, unfortunately, planners are still in the beginning. So for instance, I gave a talk on that in Romania, I remember some five years ago, and uh, the conference was dedicated to the architect's chief of counties. And so they were responsible for whatever goes on in terms of constructions in the county. And it turns out that out of them, a single one who is a pioneer and involved in many collaborative projects was open to that. And actually, whenever he was asking for an architectural or for a planning solution, he was asking for it to be a nature-based one. But for the other ones, they didn't care. So unfortunately, 
this is a little bit hard and obviously uh, when I was here, I prepared a little bit for going home and for doing some comparative studies and look at the planning system here. And indeed, you have the same idea of planning because when you do zoning, you are able to impose some criteria which will deal with the intricate details. But otherwise, when you see the big picture, it's a little bit harder to promote the nature-based solutions. So yes, vegetation is useful and um, also, the French experience, for, for instance, uh, shows that when you talk about the green infrastructure, you have to do two things. On the one hand, you need to see it in three dimensions, which means that you have tools like green facades, green roofs, which you connect with whatever lies on the ground to create a continuity of the species and also a continuum that ensures the normal functioning of the green infrastructure. And on the other hand, again, cross the scale, move it to the next scale, see it from above and connect whatever you have in the city to the outer <coughs> part of the city so that you know, species can migrate and so on. In Bucharest, we have an example of that, fortunately from the past. Nowadays, we are no longer doing nice things like that. And they were designing a park and they said, well, when people go there, they want to hear the birds chirping. And to hear them, you need to have as many birds as you can from many species. But species, there are species that do not tolerate each other. So for instance, if a certain species nests here, that eliminates the possibility of another one to nest around it. But, species, but birds prefer certain trees for nesting. So make sure you don't put too close together trees from species that if the birds nesting there won't tolerate each other. So this is the level of planning where you can maximize it and you can get the effect. Uh, the problem, and but this is just a personal thought. It's something that I would give more at the beer after than in a public conference or event. Is that when you develop metrics for doing that, uh, metrics can be easily cheated. So if you deal with the core principle, then it is clear. But when you turn it into metrics, things get, can get changed. For instance, even in my area in Bucharest, for enlarging the road, they cut off some trees and they planted more trees. But you cut off a 30-year-old tree, which has a large size, and you put in some small tree that needs 30 years to reach the size of the one you but, when, but you deal with numbers, and numbers look better. So, hope this answers your question. Dr. Scott. That was really interesting, your comparison between your three coastal areas. And if I read the scales correctly, it appears urbanization in coastal areas is very similar. <laughs> more buildings, more impervious surface. And what's even more interesting is that in this, in the three countries where I have uh, the call, the cause, the underlying cause is the same. And the underlying cause seems to be what is called in planning, derogatory planning. Derogatory planning means that you have generally a master plan for your place. But when you are to put in a specific facility or build a house or something like this, you need a zoning plan. And normally the zoning plan should fit what the master plan says. But when you do derogatory planning, you allow local interventions that violate the master plan. And so most of the developments occurred through this mechanism, be it in uh, Vietnam, be it in Algeria, be it in Romania. And there is something else. There is uh, some of these countries have even more issues and they are interesting and worthy of being explored. For instance, in uh, Algeria, they have a centralized system, but the government is not planning to do anything for tourism. It's not planning to put hotels and such for tourists. Yes. And so people turn their houses into open places for others and they charge them. It's sort of illegal, but they build houses even for this purpose. So instead of having a hotel which might have a smaller fingerprint, we built lots of small developments for this purpose since the centralized authority does not help tourism in that area. If Vietnam uh, all used a very interesting infrastructure and they basically built their city over the water, I, have, I had some images, I, they didn't fit here, 
but they appeared in the articles with developments that expand the city twice its size over the water, a floating area, or sometimes you reclaim land, and that's also having an effect. And in most cases, when you have developments, uh, development that occurs via small infrastructures, houses, individual houses, you add the pressure. I remember this being exactly on my qualifying exam in a question and I added <laughs> that point that where you have the sewerage. And if you don't deal with it properly, people will tend to discharge everything into the water. It will all then build by the water. Well, it, it was very interesting. This, it was, but as you've answered the question, the process is different in each area each culturally. Area. But the net result is still over development. And it appears that a lure to the water is, is probably one of those common factors, regardless of the governmental you know, aspects, whether it's a free market economy or a socialist you know, regime yeah. or whatever, or, or you know, other types of uh, government. The, the other thing I thought was real interesting was your slide looking at the diversity measurements. And it's very interesting when Dr. Porter and I were doing the use study, we found when you move the monocultured lawns, the microbial diversity goes way, way, that you lose your pseudomonids and aeromonids so that you end up with much less diversity. Like in a forest floor, you have so much more diversity with the decaying vegetation wood, everything else is decaying, so you end up with many more species and much greater diversity, just like you were So it's real interesting to see that trend following your research, so very interesting. Thank you very much. Other questions? In Romania, you're pointing out about forests, and in the U.S. here, we have a lot of forested areas in California, but they aren't managed as well as they can. They don't do protective burning, control burning, and then we get massive fires. Uh, we have the tools to do that, just budget cuts prevent it, I think. And uh, is are such things being done in Romanian forests? Uh, no, but you see, California is also in a very in an area exposed to the effects of climate change more than Romania, because in Romania forests occur at higher altitude, higher elevation, so fires may occur. We had forest fires, but since the country is not in a geographical area where you know you have that extreme temperatures, but it happens close by. It happened in Greece. It happened elsewhere. So there are countries close to the Mediterranean area in Europe that are more affected by that. We had some, but not as massive. Uh, and luckily, I don't know how did it happen, but our firefighters were very well instructed. And even if we have little ones, they were able to act efficiently. So they went to other countries that had experienced these issues and were able to intervene and help their big friends, big Greece. But in terms of the planning, yes, that has to do with many, many things because of course, um, first of all, perhaps the good part of what I said has been bad, having a gray area with many types of forests with different type of management for each one may still protect better some than the others. And probably that may be a solution here where people are more likely to observe the legal restrictions better than in Romania. Most of the forest cutting in Romania is illegal. And since it's illegal, you know, there are two ways of doing it. One of them would be taking this area only, but this is visible. So instead of doing that, I take it three from here, one from there, one from there, and the forest gets sparser. Uh, now, Dr. Porter, you know about the vegetation indices that basically uh, the relationship when you measure them and you derive your geospatial data, they actually make a connection between what you see from the satellite, which is basically the canopy coverage. And so it's not the species themselves, it's not the biologists that go there and see certain species. It's the density of trees pretty much that makes the difference between a forest and a natural area that's not a forest. 
So this is where it comes out. And the process is a little bit slower because they keep cutting trees until the density declassifies the area as a forest. How important are the corridor areas for enhancing diversity? It seems like I'm really interested in what you're uh, finding on some of that. That I look well, real interesting. This, this, the answer, the answer is uh, is simple. They are important, but at the same time, there should be there should be uh, an attention paid to what you have there. I mean, to the quality and to what you do. Because, for instance, in Romania, when they do planning. Um, the landscape architects usually are very likely to go to some company and the companies will suggest them to use some species because they are more decorative or something like this. They might look better, they might look nicer, they are preferred by people, but they never relate that to the bird diversity they can host and so on. So uh, obviously here the recommendation is always to use native species and so on and so forth. Don't go for bringing alien species and other problems. Kazoos. Yeah. <laughs> well, and, and also the importance of wildlife corridors to allow allow it to be more natural in terms of the interplay between the animals that live in a forest, because the feces from those animals is very important to the bacterial diversity you find in the forest floor. You know. You don't have the wildlife moving as well. Yeah. So we, I, I have not seen hardly any research on that area of looking at the width and the space and what are the pro proportions you really need to have. You're, you're in the urban planning. Do you see a lot of that evidence on that? Yes, I can see evidence on that. But again, yeah. when, 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 when I am to answer to this question, I have to be very, very attentive because right. this project, which actually... Uh, yielded the article presented here, was focusing on the large carnivores. But when you develop a corridor, you can develop it, and you tend to develop it for some <coughs> species of interest. But they never look at the fact that, you know, for instance, if you talk about amphibians, about frogs, as tadpoles, they have to stay in a lake. As uh, adults, they are mobile. And if you look about insects, some of them stay underground for 17 years and then they come back up, up to, the, to the earth level. So things like this are hard to put together because probably it won't, you know, you can devise a corridor as they've done it here for the brown bear. This was one of the species of interest. But if you want to do a corridor for all species, that will be probably impossible. You'll have just to keep a whole forest for all of them. It won't, I mean, you don't have a corridor that fits all species. And so this will be a, the problem. And even applying the methodology would be different because when they looked at this corridor, the details are very, very complicated. They looked at the feeding habits. They looked at the distribution of the species across different seasons and about the kind of uh, habitat it uses in different seasons. And so they had to put all the species together for one species. And when you, you can imagine the amount of computation and the amount of data you need and you don't always have, if you want to do it, at least for species on the red list, not for all. So this is the complicated part here. So, so it sounds like what you're saying is that you really have to target that corridor for what is your species. For one species, well, this this happened here because this was the project. That's how they devised the entire project as a pilot project because you cannot find fund doing corridors for all species. Yeah. 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 Well, folks, I hate to break up. Oh, they know. Last question. Uh, I'll call you Dr. Alex because I don't want to sound foolish pronouncing your last name. Dr. Mm -hmm. Alex, uh, <laughs> uh, you showed maps bordering Ukraine. Are you including any uh, migrant population or refugee uh, variables in your land use considerations? Not, not, yet, because, not yet, because they didn't come yet as data, but probably they, if they come, I mean, um, so far, we didn't have a research in our department on that, but probably that starts developing. On the other hand, get back to Dr. Scott's question, you know, the crane was involved in, process, in processes, uh, the process of developing corridors and such. 
And now they said that probably they will end by cutting off many forests because they don't have the resources necessary for surviving after the war. So, you know, all their environmental commitments will be also affected by this war. I found out in one of these projects. There are, there, are, there are many other implications for the country. Well, folks, I hate to bring it to a close, but we are a few minutes over. So, final round of all practice. So, Alex, thank you very much for everyone that participated online. And for those of you here in person, and we'll get together this time next week.